Good morning, church, and welcome to the online service here at Spanish Fort. We're glad that you're watching, and if you're part of the family here at Spanish Fort, we are praying and hoping that everything's going well with you, that you're all safe, and that uh, we will soon be back together again in this place worshiping God. If you're not a part of the family here at Spanish Fort, we would love for you to visit our website, SpanishFortChurch.org. Uh, go there, check us out, and we also would love when we're all able to be back together for you to come and join us for a worship service here. This week, Bo put out a uh, Facebook uh, video where he was encouraging us to um, kind of share photos and post and find ways that we can stay connected. I want to challenge you this morning to take a picture of your family worshiping together this morning. Post it up on Facebook and use the hashtag Spanish Fort Online. And that way we can click on that and we'll be able to see everybody's photos as we uh, worship together. I remind us all that this is about God. You see, whether we're on a pew or whether we're on a couch, it doesn't matter. God is with us. And today as we gather together with our families and as we praise God and as we worship him, let's be reminded of that. Usually about this time, I would tell you to stand and let's get ready to praise God. You don't have to stand unless you just really want to, but nevertheless, let's get ready to praise our God this morning. Light of the world, you step down into darkness, open my eyes, let me see, beauty that made this heart adore you, hope of a life spent with you, here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say. Yeah. 
Hello, church. Glad to be with you, if only by technology. Today, I'd like to share some thoughts around communion with God. And I'd like to start off by reading a page from a daily devotional that I use. And this is from God's perspective. It says, I'm calling you to a life of constant communion with me. Basic training includes learning to live above your circumstances, even while interacting on a cluttered plane of life. You yearn for a simplified lifestyle so that your communication with me can be uninterrupted. But I challenge you to relinquish that fantasy of an uncluttered world. Accept each day as it comes and find me in the midst of it all. The day and age we live in today with all the uncertainty, God is always there and he continuously seeks his communion with us. The circumstances that we're in today with not so much a cluttered life, but now we're finding ourselves without of time. God still wants that relationship. He wants us to commune with him. And most of what we see on the media is about the coronavirus. And that's not real good news, but God assures us through his word that he's always with us. God tells us through his good news that he loves us and he gave his son to die for us. We often refer to the gospel as the good news. And I would like to share with you Paul's definition of what that gospel is out of 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. Beginning in verse 1, it says, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel which I preached to you, which you received, and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I have received, I passed on to you as of first importance. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. That is the good news. And now we have an opportunity to remember that good news, that death, that burial, that resurrection of our Lord and Savior and all that affords to us as his followers. Let us pray together. Father God, we do thank you for this day, for every day. For this occasion that we can be together remotely, Father, as your people. And throughout the world, we can participate in this communion service with you. Even though we're not able to be with each other right now, we know that you're always there. We're grateful for your son, for the life that he lived, the death that he died, and the resurrection, the victorious resurrection that brings us a hope of an eternal life. Father, we're thankful now for this time that we can specifically remember his body, that precious body that hung on that cross for our sins. And we pray, Father, that as we partake, we would be mindful of your love, your desire to commune with us, for the love of Christ and that he hung on that cross in our stead and for the love that we can have for each other because you have taught us how to love. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen.
we now have an opportunity to remember that precious blood that was shed on Calvary's cross for our sins. Let's bow together as we thank God. Father God, again, we do thank you for this opportunity that we have to commune with you, to remember Christ, and the precious blood that he willingly shed on Calvary's cross, Father, that we might be able to be washed in that blood, that we can be redeemed by that blood. And we're thankful now, Father, for this time that we can remember that in a special way, that blood that washes away our sins, the love that you had when you sent him as that sacrifice, and the love that he had when he willingly shed his blood on that cross for us. Father, we're grateful for this fruit of the vine that represents that blood, and we pray that as we partake, we would focus our hearts and our minds on that wonderful sacrifice he made for us. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. As we now focus our thoughts on contribution, giving back to God what is rightfully His, I'd like to share the thoughts with you that, that even though we can't be together and be excited about the little children coming forward to give of their means, we still have an opportunity. And just like the first century church, it is still an active part of our worship. In times that we're living in now, the need is much greater than it has been for all the works of the church that continue to need our support. There's others, no doubtably, are, are, are out there that we need to be involved in. With all the confusion and us not being able to meet together, many of you have uh, struggled to, to find out a way to give back. After our prayer, the slide will come up and, and give you information that you can be able to do that. But at this time, let's thank, let's thank God for everything that we do have and we do enjoy and often take for granted. Let's pray together. Father, again, we thank you for everything in this life, especially for the spiritual blessings, but we're also mindful of the physical things that you give us every day, things that we often overlook and take for granted. And we live in a world of plenty, Father, in, in such a way that where we, we're worried that we may not have basic necessities, we panic and we go out and hoard everything that we can get our hands on. But help us to realize, Father, we're but stewards over the things that you've given us and that your word teaches us that if we seek you and your kingdom first, all these things will be added to us. There's no need for us to worry. Father, help us to continue to have the joy and the gratitude as we give back to you, that you would guide us to be good stewards, that we may use the things you give us to bring glory and honor to your name, 
by serving your people. Again, we thank you for Christ who makes all things possible. It's in his precious name we pray. Amen. Unto the hill of Calvary, my Savior went courageously, and there he bled and died for me, hallelujah, for the cross. And on that day the world was changed, a final perfect lamb was slain, Let Players and the props are all in place, but this is no play. It actually began before heaven ever breathed life into the lungs of Adam. We're only days away from Calvary. And when the Son of Man knows the end is near, then we begin to hear what's really important. Each step is calculated. Deliberate deeds are done. Every act premeditated. And important matters are revealed. But here's the question we need to know. With just one week before the cross, what is it that Jesus wanted us to hear? 
What message did he want to leave with us? What did he want us to know? This is what matters most. And so this morning, I want us to retrace those steps, to go back and to look. Look at the five days that led up to Calvary. And Jesus wrote the ending, but now it must be lived out. What would that message be? It's Sunday. It's five days to Calvary. When you get to heaven, who would you like to talk to? Would you like to swap stories with the apostles? Or maybe have a discussion with Abraham or one of the other Old Testament characters that we've read about over the years? Maybe talk a little doctrine with Paul. What about the guy that gave his donkey and colt for Jesus to use? We begin in Matthew chapter 21. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethage to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. Wouldn't you like to ask that guy some questions? Did you know? Did you have any idea what your animals were going to be used for? Did you have a clue that God would be riding one of those animals. You see, in the midst of the triumphant entry with people throwing down their coats and and shouting with the palm leaves and with the cries of Hosanna in the highest, what about the guy that gave his animals to Jesus? Maybe here's the point that Jesus is trying to make. Maybe here's the message that he's trying to give each of us. You and I both have something that if given back to God can carry Jesus a little further down the road. Now, maybe that's just giving hugs. Or maybe that's teaching children. Or maybe it's writing a check. But whatever it is, it's your donkey, it's your colt, and Jesus needs it. And could it be that God is wanting to mount your donkey to enter another place, to enter another situation, to enter another heart? And I wonder if somewhere, maybe even in heaven, that that God has a special place that's, that's designated for those things the uncommon that he used, maybe Rahab's rope or David's sling. Or maybe over in the corner is the, is the staff that smote the waters, a manger. And against the wall, perhaps there's a Roman beam that has blood stains on it. I have no idea if those things are in heaven. But likely the people that use them will be. And maybe the message five days from Calvary for us is that Jesus is saying, I need you to be one of many who gives little things to a big God. It's now Monday. And we're four days from Calvary. Speedy Morris was the basketball coach for LaSalle University. And one morning he was shaving when his wife ran in and said, Sports Illustrated is on the phone. He got so excited, this was his moment of fame. He hurried up and managed to cut himself while trying to finish shaving. He went out of the bathroom and stumbled and fell down the stairs. He limps in with blood on his face and still filled with shaving cream and grabs the phone and says, Sports Illustrated. 
And the guy on the other end said, yes, and for 75 cents an issue, you can have a year's subscription. (laughs) Imagine his disappointment. Jesus, on Monday morning, returns to the temple, and there's nothing but disappointment. Again, in Matthew 21, he said to them, and it's written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. It's the Passover. And everyone has come from every region. It's the highlight of the Jewish calendar, and they had turned it into a bunch of faith peddlers. It's not hard to see why Jesus got angry. People had come from many miles to offer to God. They are there on the biggest day of the year, they are there to worship God. So what might be the message for us that Jesus is trying to give to us four days from Calvary? Maybe he's asking us to look at our hearts when we come to the house of God. When I sing, do I sing with the spirit and understanding or am I just mouthing words? When we come to this table, Do I really focus in on the the atoning sacrifice that was made for me? The things that Jesus said, I want you to remember, or does my mind drift? When we go before the very throne room of God and we speak to our Father and we make known to Him the things that are on our hearts, do I focus in on who I'm talking to? Do I dwell on the words? Or do I think about something else? This is not an impulse show. This is not a divine temper tantrum. It is a deliberate act of our Lord who is fed up with what he sees. And the message is clear. This is God's house. And God is very concerned about what happens here. It's now Tuesday, and we're three days from Calvary. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus begins to prepare his disciples for what's coming. He begins by talking about how it is that we're to survive life. He gives them a rather long list of things that are going to happen. He says there are going to be people who will come along and say that I am the Christ, but they'll fool a lot of people. And you're going to be arrested and you're going to be hurt and some of you will be in prison and some of you may even be killed. You'll be hated because you believed in me. It's far from the pep rally speech you might give a team before you go out and play the big game. It's more like a commander who's speaking to his soldiers before they go into battle. But that's exactly the message that Jesus wants to give us. You see, our Lord has always been honest about the life that we're called to live and the cost there is in living that life. There are no guarantees that you're going to go unscathed. There are no guarantees or promises that you will never experience pain. In fact, many times it might just be the opposite. And so Jesus tells them, here's how you survive life. Here's how you survive the battle. And he begins with the assurance of victory. In chapter 24 and verse 13, he says, But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And then he gives to us the the assurance of accomplishment in verse 14. And and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And finally, we get the assumption of, or the assurance rather, of completion. Then the end will come. There's an interesting verse that Paul gives us over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Paul there in the context is reassuring some folks that that they have not missed out on the return of Christ. And he's telling them about that return. In verse 16 he wrote this or said this, "For, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command and with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God. Another version says that he will return with a great shout. 
Have you ever stopped to wonder what that shout might be? I mean, this is the first audible message that we will hear from God. These are the words that mark the end of time and the beginning of eternity. This is the inaugural words of heaven. And I can't say for sure. I have no idea what those words will be. I do know this. It will be the end of the pains of earth and the beginning of the joys of heaven. It may be come home. As Jesus gathers his kingdom to carry back to God. It may be arise as Jesus declares those from the grave to come forth. But maybe, just maybe, those words will be no more. No more pain. No more troubles. No more tears. No more viruses. No more. And the lasting memory that Jesus wanted us to have is that when the rapids of life come upon you, when like a raging river we're overcome with all of the concerns and all the anxieties and all the worries and all the things that, that come with life, those that endure will be saved. It's Wednesday, and we're two days from Calvary. This is the day that we hear Jesus deliver his last sermon. In Matthew's account, we read him talking about the final judgment, what that will look like. And he answers the question, what will be the sign of the saved? Is it their scholarship, their knowledge? Is it their ability to quote scripture or win an argument? What will it be? And then he tells us. The sign of the save will be their love for the least. In Matthew 25, and then he will answer them saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to the one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. I've got to tell you, all the teachings of Jesus, maybe this is the one that hits home the most. I mean, why could have he not said something like, well, the sign of the saved will be the number of times that you read your Bible. Or how many times you wrote a check. Or how many times you attended church. He didn't say that. Instead, what he said was this, to see me in you. That's the sign of the saved. It's not seeing someone as an inconvenience, but an opportunity. It's leaving the office and walking down the hall to talk to that person who's regretting their divorce and missing their kids. It's to go into the streets and give away a sandwich and not a sermon. Jesus said to have people see me and you. And in order to do that, we have to see the unattractive. We have to open our eyes to the forgotten. Jesus, in that final sermon, before he's to go to the cross, says, here's what I want you to remember. I want you to remember that light. You know the one, don't you? It's the one the little children hold up all the time. This little Christian light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. He said, before I go, what I want you to know is this, what I'm really going to be looking for when I come back. It's now Thursday. We're one day away from the cross. When I was growing up, me and my sister would play church. We would go into the living room because mom had a really nice coffee table in there and she had this huge Bible sitting on it. 
maybe you grew up with one of those two. I mean, this thing is probably eight inches thick. And it's this big. And it's covered with the hardest plastic covering I've ever seen. I think it's bulletproof. But it made an incredible church setting for us. And we would go in and we would play church and we would go get some crackers and some juice and we would prepare all that stuff and we would take turns leading the singing, saying the prayers, and even took turns preaching. We even took turns responding to the invitation. But the best part, the best part was when we did the Lord's Supper. When we would get to take that cracker and eat it and we would get to drink that juice. That was play acting. What Jesus talks about here on the day before Calvary is no play acting. It's the night that he spent with those who would be served by the best. And when I read Matthew's account of the Lord's Supper, something incredible surfaces. Jesus is the person that behind it all. He selected the place, he designated the time, he set the table, he picked the menu, he blessed it, he broke it, he gave it. Jesus invited them to the table and he does the same thing for us every week. He invites us to come here. He invites us to come back and to remember, to remember the bread, to remember his body that was offered in our stead, to remember the blood, the blood that was shed to wash away our sins, to remember that God died for each of us. And it's not a performance where God is our audience. It's not a ceremony where we do all the work and God watches. He joins us here. And he asks us to remember. Remember you're forgiven. Remember your hope is in me. Remember what I did for each of you. And on this final night before the cross, Jesus says, I don't want you to ever forget. And then he goes to the garden. And when he gets to the garden, he, he, he stops. And he pauses there. And he addresses the group of his closest. Because you see, this is the last time that that they'll ever hear him speak before they all scatter and run. And notice what he does. He doesn't accuse. He doesn't lecture. He doesn't preach a sermon. He prays. And here's what he said. He said, I pray for these men, but I also pray for all people who will believe in me because of the teaching of these men. Father, I pray that all people who believe in me can be one. I pray that these people can also be one in us so that the world will believe that you sent me. And then he goes a little further and he asks three of the closest to go with him. And it's then that Jesus asked the question. Is there any way? God, is there any way that this cup can pass from me? And before the words had left his lips, he knew the answer. And it was then that heaven made its decision. Thy will be done. And don't dare forget this. Jesus would rather go to hell for you and me than to go to heaven without us. And so this morning as we close, the chaos has begun, the the enemies of God are plotting. But the final thing that God wants us to know is that God is an inviting God. He invited Mary to the birth of his son. He invited fishermen to, to come and follow him, he invites sinners to start over. And over and over again, we're able to see the invitations of God. If you're thirsty, come and drink. Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to the feast. Come and follow me. Come. 
Jesus, he's not inviting us to a meal. He's inviting us to a life. And here's the most incredible thing. He gives us all a choice. A choice of what we will do with that invitation. We can't choose the weather. We, we can't choose the economy. We can't choose when all this stuff is going to end. But every single one of us can make the choice of having life in Christ. Let's bow together. Father God, we thank you for all that you do. But this morning we're especially grateful for the cross. We're grateful for the message that Jesus left us. Father, I pray that we will dwell on the words that he gave us those last five days while he walked this earth. We'll take it to heart. We'll put it into our lives. And Father, we are so grateful this morning that Jesus made it to Calvary, that he was willing to go there, that he laid his life down for each one of us. And today we all have the choice that we can accept that atoning sacrifice. We can discover that cleansing blood in our lives and our sins can be washed away. We can have a relationship with you and we can look forward when Jesus returns and takes us all home. Thank you for being our God and thank you for loving us the way you have. We ask it in the name of Jesus and all the church said, amen. Thank you again for being with us today. I hope that you've been blessed. I hope you've been encouraged. Be safe and hopefully real soon. We'll be back together again. God bless.